All right, so now we're on to each area in the GI tract and its specialized secretory activity. So first we'll start in the mouth with salivary secretion, which is an important process. And just in case you haven't heard of it, I said I will mention every once in a while some terms. So there's something called Sorgen's syndrome um, that is characterized by a lack of salivary secretion. This can be because of radiation activity on the head and neck um, from cancer therapeutics. This can also just be a, a genetic abnormality um, that needs to be treated with drugs that will increase salivary activity. And thinking about the fact that we know the parasympathetic system, so PNS, parasympathetic nervous system is most active with the GI tract and it releases acetylcholine at each of its neurons or nerves as we call them in the periphery. Um, those drugs are what we call cholinergics, meaning that they mimic acetylcholine and bind to acetylcholine receptors so that we can have activation of those cells and that activity. Okay, the salivary system, there's three big glands. There's the sublingual gland. That's an exocrine gland because it's making its saliva. You don't want your saliva going into your bloodstream. You want it going through a salivary duct and then out into the mouth. Uh, so that is from underneath the tongue and that squirts out pretty uh, rapidly and strongly. There's the submandibular gland, literally underneath the mandible. And then the largest is the parotid gland. The parotid is huge. The last time I was in the gross lab, uh, Todd and I uh, were dissecting out the TMJ, which was a really fun dissection. But we got to see how big the parotid is and how much innervation comes to it. It's really complicated. And there's one big duct that comes out of the parotid and then it empties right above one of the back molars here, depending on how many adult teeth that individual has. Uh, the parotids can become inflamed. They become inflamed if just uh, bacteria gets in there. It's called parotiditis, inflammation of the parotid. Um, the, that can also be called by, or caused by mumps. So mumps causes parotid swelling. And it is called idiopathic. I'll write that down. Idiopathic, because I love that term. Idiopathic. So pathos means disease, right? So pathology, study of disease. Idio, like if somebody's an idiot, <laughs> it means they don't know anything. So idiopathic means we don't know why that happened. So when diseases are characterized that way, it's like, yeah, we don't know why. Um, but it's idiopathic in nature that people that drink a lot, so in chronic alcoholism, you see uh, enlargement of the parotids, and they're not really sure about why that occurs, but it does uh, enlarge. There are also things called parotid stones, which can get lodged in this duct, which is pretty small, and those can kind of be massaged out, um, or they can be kind of sonicated like other stones that form, but they're relatively soft. So if we look at saliva, there's a bunch of different things that are associated with this nice, basic, stable pH, um, high mucus content, and high water content product. Um, tylins are a term for a variety of digestive enzymes. So the tylin product there is amylase, so salivary amylase breaks down carbohydrates or starches, so anything sugar-related. So that we run on glucose, you guys know that. So as soon as we have starches broken down, uh, those can be utilized right away if they're in the mouth. Other things that saliva contains, there's mucus, and the specific protein there uh, associated with it is called mucin. And something that is mucinous is uh, a little bit thicker and more viscous. And mucin is something that not only exists in saliva, but in certain types of diseases, like in hypothyroidism. There's something that's called non-pitting edema. So when you put a finger into somebody's arm and make a pit with your finger and you remove your finger, there is a time that it takes for that pit to rebound. And depending on how many seconds it is, that gives you a number. So sometimes people have point or plus one pitting edema or plus two pitting edema. Um, 
mucinous edema is when instead of fluid forming underneath the skin um, in general edema, it's high mucin. So it doesn't form a pit, but the skin takes on an interesting waxy appearance because of that. So it's a dermatologic finding as well. The other things in saliva are ions. So there's a high amount of potassium and bicarbonate. We know potassium is positive, right? So K plus and bicarbonate, um, sodium bicarbonate, what is that? And I, man, let's see, now I, I shouldn't have even started by NaCO3, NaCO3. That's also very, very basic and high pH. Um, and sodium chloride is something that is generally excreted or exchanged for the potassium carbonate or bicarbonate because we want the potassium bicarb to be a part of the saliva. And that will be exchanged through a pump system for sodium chloride, which we know is very high in extracellular environments. So there's a small amount of sodium chloride because of the pump system that exists on both of these walls. Um, but primarily you want a nice high pH, so potassium and bicarbonate um, are the largest component in the saliva. So as I mentioned before, we have acinar cells. So a cini is a singular acinar cell or the, um, yes. So these, they look like grapes. They're little clusters of cells that do active activity activity and they are the primary secretors. They make the tylins and the mucin and they combine that with extracellular fluid so it can move through the duct. Acinar cells, so you also have um, a cini in the lungs, you have them in the pancreas, and they're just little clusters of cells that are doing things. So in that case, this is the primary secretion. So making these two products, one of them an enzyme, one of them mucin uh, to help with adherence, and the other is just extracellular fluid from the area. And there's also a little bit of muscle on the inside of these acinar cells so that once those products are created, we can contract some of this and move that product into the duct. So the duct is just this lumen that collects the products from the various acinar cells. All right, the second stage involves the salivary glands. And in this picture, it looks pretty complicated. So we'll look at the, the image on the next slide. But there will be absorption, which means going into the body. Right, so sodium chloride go together. So those are absorbed into the body. And then we want the secretory activity, so secreted into a system, um, to be primarily the bicarbonate and then the potassium. All right, so this is all written down for you here. Let me talk you through it on this slide. So here is the lumen of the salivary gland. So if we're looking at this picture, the lumen is the inside. So that's the part with the chemoreceptors, with the tactile receptors, and it's activated when things are in the mouth. All right, so this is the lumen, here is the blood, and we already looked at these glandular cells and we said that they have nervous activation, uh, there's information about what is in the blood being absorbed, and it's transmitted through diff diffusion and through nervous regulation to the cell. Okay, so here is just general interstitial fluid, so the fluid that exists between cells and tissue layers, we have it everywhere. And this is one cell making up the lumen, so just an epithelial cell. So there's a couple processes going on here. So on this side, on the, this is the luminal side, we have an active ATPase, and we already know that sodium potassium pumps are the most prevalent pumps in the body. So these are there to regulate the resting potential. So here you see negative 70 millivolts. So this will help regulate the cell size and its activity. And those are always running unless there is a lack of ATP. If there's a lack of ATP, it means there is a stopping of blood flow or breathing. So that can happen in shock or death. So otherwise, these are running. And remember, this is active transport because things are moving against their concentration gradients. 
we know potassium is really high inside of cells and sodium is really high outside of cells and so is chloride and they travel together. So when we want potassium to move opposite, so it would go naturally in because of high, the, the way concentration gradients work. If we want to move it in a different direction, then we need to use active transport. Same thing with sodium. When we, we know sodium is really high out here and it's not high in here, so naturally sodium would move into the cell through passive diffusion. So here we have active transport to move things against their concentration gradient. Okay, so carbonic anhydrase we talk about a lot in this class and it has to do with the utilization of CO2. So CO2 is a byproduct of cellular activity. We know that there's ATP here being generated to run these pumps and also for activity for all the intracellular things to happen. When CO2 is brought into a cell, carbonic anhydrase breaks it down into um, sodium bicarbonate and there is an extra hydrogen left over. In the GI tract and in the respiratory tract, that is really important. That extra hydrogen is going to be combined to make hydrochloric acid. So that's kind of what you see up here, hydrochloric acid. So this little so or, um, hydrogen group, not only do we have an antiporter here, so remember antiporters are moving things in the opposite direction of where they should go, um, or sorry, of each other generally, there is an antiporter here to eject this acid from the cell because we don't want acid being incorporated into the saliva. That would make the saliva low pH. We don't want that. Um, but it helps, it, that exchanges the hydrogen from this reaction um, for sodium, which will then come in to help power this pump. So the whole goal is that we want potassium entering so that potassium can leave here through the lumen. So this pump essentially will be run. So CO2 is created through the cellular activity. Carbonic anhydrase is going to liberate this single hydrogen group. Um, the hydrogen will be exchanged for sodium, which comes in to power this pump, bringing potassium in. Then, through these various cellular interactions, we will reconfigure so that we have sodium bicarb, because we are now dealing with water as well. We're going to exchange that through an antiporter system for bicarbonate. Remember, sodium and potassium are very high up here, so they can come on in. So the chloride's going to come into the cell, and that could be exchanged for the bicarbonate. Here's your sodium potassium ATPase that will help kick potassium outside of the cell, and that should be running all of the time. So that at the end of the day, all of these processes are happening in kind of like I'll trade you for this and you trade me for this. We are exchanging things like our hydrogen and our sodiums and our chlorides to achieve the final goal, which is making a high amount of potassium and bicarbonate to be injected into the lumen of the salivary gland. Another reason why this is important, if this seems like who cares, this is really complicated. So see this chloride here? See that guy? Why is that important? There's something called cystic fibrosis. We talk about it a lot in pathophysiology. And cystic fibrosis is typically a terminal disease before the age of 30. And we'll talk about a lot of reasons why that is. Um, but the end thing that happens is that there is a high viscosity of mucus in the body. And the reason for that is this process isn't working appropriately, not just here, but in all cells of the body where that's important. So if chloride isn't being exchanged appropriately, we don't get the water that we need out here. There's too much um, 
there's not enough chloride coming in to power these other interactions. So what we would say in general, this is always a board question too, so hopefully you watch this, is a problem with chloride transport. So this is a genetic disease. It is autosomal recessive, um, but cystic fibrosis, it is a pathologic change of the genetic conformations of chloride transporters, ending up making a very thick, viscid mucus, um, high amount of mucin, and a problem with chloride transport, which makes it very likely that there's a lot of respiratory disorders and infections, but uh, more dangerously, those mucus plugs form in the pancreas, and we'll see why that is so fatal in just a second. All right, finishing up saliva. The other ones, maybe they're not, maybe they are more complicated, but that's your saliva. Uh, the nervous regulation here, mainly parasympathetic nervous systems. The origination point for these uh, nerves projections is the inferior olive, or sometimes it's called olivary nuclei in the brain stem, so lower down. Salivatory nuclei are at the juncture, which means the connection point between the pons and the brain stem. Whenever you see the word pontine, that means it's in the pons. The brain stem is the lowest you can physically go in the brain. Um, some neuroscientists don't consider it part of the brain at all. Some do. We'll just consider the pons and brain stem two different pieces for now. Um, but the nuclei are in that area. And we'll see in this picture, see where it says tractus solitarius. We talked about the nucleus tractus solitarius. Remember, nuclei is a group of cell bodies that does the same thing. So please remember that the nucleus tractus solitarius is the integrating center for all of these afferent and efferent nervous uh, potentials. So we get integration of these signals and make sure that everything's working properly. So this nuclei which is overseen by the NTS, it's excited by something in the mouth, tactile stimuli. So that's why when you put a mint in your mouth, when you put gum in your mouth, you salivate more, which helps to freshen your breath. We know that <coughs> saliva definitely freshens your breath. So when you wake up in the morning, your mouth's really dry and your breath doesn't smell that great. The more you talk, the fresher your breath. So. Anytime there's something in your mouth, you get more activation. There's also some higher level hypothalamic innervations to these areas, areas, areas in the anterior or front part of the hypothalamus, which means you, you can actually measure this. Um, when you smell or think about a food that you really like, like your favorite food, uh, you'll salivate at the thought of that food or even the taste of that food. Whenever you put it in your mouth, you do this. Uh, you salivate more than with foods that you dislike. So I hate bacon ever since I was a kid. I've always hated bacon. When I smell bacon, I just I hate it. It makes me want to puke. So I don't salivate at all on the days in Sassy when they're cooking bacon. But the days they're cooking brownies, I salivate quite a bit. And that is because it is preferentially uh, controlled. All right, there's also reflexes in the stomach and upper GI tract. So if there's irritation of the stomach, uh, if there's something in there that is irritating or something that is considered poisonous by the body, there's an increase in salivation uh, to help drive and help regulate the vomiting response. So you get this secretion of nice, stable, high pH saliva uh, to help protect the mouth, the teeth, and the soft palate in the case of nausea and vomiting. Uh, blood supply, we know that in order for an area to work, we need more blood going to that area, so we need vasodilation. There is something in saliva itself called calicrin, and it splits itself through a globular process to form bradykinin, which is an irritant um, it formed in the kinin cascade, which activates pain receptors and generally acts to be vasodilating in its activities.